Spoilers, oh spoilers, oh spoilers. What's up guys, all so you want to do a... This is not going to be quick. I'm warning you right now, this is not going to be quick. But here we are to do a breakdown slash discussion and analysis slash review of the spoilers for chapter 249 of Jujutsu Kaisen, which is known as the Decisive Battle in the Demon of Fezzi Shinjuku Part 21. No, I have not spontaneously developed the ability to read Japanese, I just see the 21. Half this darn chapter doesn't even take place in Shinjuku. Gege, a new one. Please, but when I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this chapter, off the spoilers, the raws alone, is, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling certain types of ways, in numerous different ways, I've got old copium, new copium, kinda new copium, kinda old copium, <sighs> y'all, 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 and uh, hey, I know the Yuta fan, I wonder how Yuta fans generally feel, because as a Yuta fan myself, well, I'll, I'll put, I'll put my agendas and biases aside, I'm very mixed on how this chapter does Yuta. In some ways, I am geeking and tweaking. On a power scaling level, I'm losing my good mind. But at the same time, on a character writing level and a reveal level, I'm kind of not losing my mind. But we have so much to talk about, so let's not waste any more time, and let's hop right into it. Editing me. Ready. Three, two, one, go. What's up, guys? That guy with a... Pencil here. Fun fact, I do happen to have it on me and keep it on me at all times, just like Yuta Kotsu tends to have it on him and keep it on him at all times, and I'll be real with you. I... <laughs> you ever be... You ever be happy and sad at the same time? Because you're happy, you're right, but you're also sad that you're right because of what it means for the character. I mentioned, I mentioned a lot of people... Not a lot of people. Some people in the comments were having copium. But I mentioned it seemed pretty weird in 248 that mystically, magically, the rule gets added and then Yuta shows up. A lot of people were, I'm not going to say huffing copium, but huffing a little bit of copium that, oh, well, maybe Kenny, like, pre-set a rule that, you know, under the condition where he perished, then bada bing, bada boom, things go crazy out the womb, and then he would transfer Tengen over on it. I didn't think that was, like, established at all, anywhere. So I just said and believed that Yuda fumbled. And this chapter hard confirms that Yuda fumbled. And here's where my issues start immediately. Number one, Yuda's not this stupid. He's not, he's, like, it's, it's the, it's the sheer stupidity, right? It's the sheer stupidity of engaging with Kinjaku like, like, you know, you know he's the brain. This isn't, this isn't news, this isn't rocket science, like, this is, this is just, this is basic knowledge. Like, you have the Shibuya footage, Yuda. It's kind of, it goes back to, like, the whole Gojo either A, not knowing that Tsukuna had a burialist domain, despite there being numerous people who could have told him that, or B, him knowing that and still making the moves he did anyway. Yuda, Mr. Second Strongest Sorcerer of the Modern Day. Arguably now with this chapter, indubitably the third strongest in the verse, depending on how you see it. And how quickly you think he can activate domain and all the stuff like that, whatever durability feats or scaling feats you think he gets from this. But... Once again, that's a little bit discussion for a little bit later. But still, the fact that he swung for the neck. Here's the thing. I can I can somewhat rationalize it, right? Because this, your skull, a lot thicker and a lot more durable than your neck. It just it's it's why all creatures pretty much instinctively attack the neck, like lions or tight I'm gonna say. Cats in general, cats in general, cats typically always go for the neck. Yeah, even dogs at times go for the neck. You're, you're legitimately supposed to go for the neck. Like one of the weakest spots in the body, the jugular. You poke somebody in the jugular, bada bing, bada boom. You crush somebody's windpipe, their throat, all that. So I get why you would swing there on like a easy to remove level, right? Because, for example, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the back because, you know, I am stupid enough to accidentally cut myself. So, like, I get this would be much easier than this. But Yuda, you had the cleanest, smoothest, and most buttery setup ever, and you knew he was the brain. You knew he was the brain. He was still talking, Yuda. Why did you stay why did you walk why did you have a conversation with Bro when he was ahead? Why wasn't Rika immediately summoned? Why not? Why, why not? Like 
don't get me wrong, I'm still happy that Yuta got the dub. Forget, like, as much as I love Big Kenny, I am more than happy that Yuta got the dub, and I'm more than happy he got the dub in a strategic sense, but the fact that it would have been so easy for him to aim... Let's see. Like, maybe about half a foot. Okay, I think my head's much bigger than just half a foot. But, like, just to aim, like, eight inches, nine inches higher... And, this, and, like, literally, the rest of the plot can't... Ha well, not the rest of the plot. I don't know what happens with the rest of the plot. But at least in this case, the rest of this chapter, the transfer of the merge, everything can't happen if you'd have just used his head and went for the head. Like, this is this is verbatim, word for word, bar for bar. I haven't seen the comparison yet, but then again, I hopped on, like, one live stream, made a couple jokes, and dipped. But this is literally the Thanos situation. Infinity War. All over again. And to be fair, I think... <laughs> When did Infinity War come out? 2018. It's the end of 2018. So, so Yuda, Yuda should have gone for that. He should know. Like, this is literally verbatim, word for word, bar for bar, the Thanos situation. Where Thor, in the matter of arrogance, through... So I'll have to call him Mjolnir. Through Stormbreaker, hit Thanos dead in the chest, got the moral victory, the satisfying victory, overpowered, outdid, and dominated the main villain, but he just didn't go for the most vital part of the head. Yuna did the same thing here. But for Thor, where it's, I'm not going to say excusable, in the sense that he was also kind of stupid, not going for that, and not like, I don't know, ripping through Thanos, like, he arguably... The Thor situation could have been solved if he put a little bit more of his back into it and, like, tore straight through Thanos' chest. I highly doubt if Bro had a massive gaping hole in his chest, he was still going to be able to hit that and drop a whole bar on him. But the fact that Yuta Kotsu, when he has a Shikigami that could easily have appeared and just... When he knows the fact that Kenjaku's a brain, he could have just swung higher. When there's... When it's so easy for him to have done it, it feels contrived that he didn't do it even though I understand why he didn't do it. It's kind of, it's the byproduct of skipping the Yuta versus Kenny fight traditionally. It is it is just a flat out byproduct of it. You have to make Yuta stupid in order for this to happen. Or you have to introduce something like a backup rule mechanic where X equals, if X equals Y, then Z happens. So you have to do something like that. But Gege didn't establish that. So he had to intentionally make Yuta just blatantly incompetent. Like I... I really can't see a justification. I'll wait for the translations. I'll wait to see what is said otherwise. But the fact that this is even a scenario that can happen is all because of Yuta's ineptitude. Is it still fantastic that base Yuta perception blitz Kenjaku? Amazing. Scrumbly umptious. Beautiful. I just... I like. I kind of just want to grab him by the shoulders and shake him. Because he's, he's, he's just stupid. It's stupid. It's stupid. And the whole conversation he has is stupid, and the weight that he does is stupid. Like, all this is stupid. But if you like that, when it be like that, it's just when it be like that, I guess. Like, it's not really anything I can do about it. It just bothers me because I know Yuta's better than this. <laughs> like, it, it's crazy. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed because I know I, I should expect a better generational performance than this. From Yuta Akotsu. Like, he, like, he ain't dumb. I don't know why he fell for the okie doke, but... You know, this is the Yuta fan in me speaking. For the Kenjaku fan in me, I'm happy I was right, and I'm happy that bro got to cook a little bit more, and may be able to cook a little bit further. But of course, what happens? You may be wondering, okay, pencil man, all this about Yuta fumbling, Yuta making a stupid mistake, Yuta doing this, Yuta doing that. You, you, you would hate her. Tell me, what would you have preferred Yuta to do? Well, I told you, just like crush his head immediately. But we see that due to Yuta, you know, fumbling the bag a little bit, the cursed spirits begin to burst from Kenny's body. Now, admittedly, I was expecting a little bit more. Like, notably, we see all these cursed spirits come out, and they come out in mass from Ghetto's, or Kenjaku's body. And they explode massively in this burst of cursed spirits. Now, is it just me, or are there, like, no special grades here? Or at least nothing that seems special. Like, maybe this is just going to show that, like, Yuta Kotsu, like, say all these are special grade. Yuta's just, like, slashing through them all. Bada bing, bada boom. And here's the thing. Upon, like, my first glance at the spoilers, even though I knew it was basically impossible because we had already cut to the Yuta versus 
Suka in a fight at the end of 248, and I knew it was impossible. I had the slightest bit of hope we would have actually gotten Yuta versus Kenny here, because here's the one reason why maybe you don't send Maki. Maybe. Because if Kenny did drop a billion special grade curses on her domer, then she likely wouldn't have been able to one-tap them. But I'm not going to lie, these things low-key look like grade ones, grade twos, and Maki also would have gone for the brain, presumably. Unless he's... Here's the thing. No, no matter who you send here, it's going to be a stupid scenario. Like, like, I, like no matter... Because you, you have to have... If you're going to have... Trans, if the end goal... I mean, how do I put this? If the end goal is to get the merger out of Kenny's hands and get it to Sukuna, the person's going to have to make the mistake. It's kind of... Like, I don't want to... I don't want to call it plot armor in the sense that the villains have plot armor. Because clearly Kenny doesn't. He may just straight up perish in this chapter, even though I have hope and hope for that too. But... That being the case, he may have just straight perished in this chapter. So clearly he doesn't have that much plot armor. But the fact that the story is contrived in this way makes you believe that even if Maki were here, she also would have gone for the neck and would have had a conversation. If Yuji were here, he also would have gone for the neck and had a conversation. If Yuji were here, he also would have gone for... Like, no matter what, I feel like whoever you pull and plug in this scenario, it probably would have ended the same way. And the reason you see me so, like... <laughs> indifferent to this i know like because like this is this is the one reason i'll admit this is the one reason why i did agree with the common consensus that yuda would be the overall better pick the safer pick the pick you go with in this scenario in particular the reason i was okay with it is because of a scenario like this where if the plan failed or fell through or something of the sort or somebody fumbled like let's just let's just call it real if somebody fumbled this would be better you to dealing with a bunch of curses notably he doesn't deal with them in the way that i would have expected him to like personally slide a ring on yell perish and then just watch as they all fall to the might of the second strongest sorcerer the new strongest sorcerer of the modern day let's just be real <laughs> right now gojo is still down so you right now is the strongest sorcerer of the modern day i feel like <laughs> This is just the Maki Glazer in me, and this is the me wondering if Maki's really going to be reduced to fighting her Ume. I hate to say reduced, but like, darn, it's, it's really feeling that way. But with that being the case, it feels like Maki could have dealt with this if this is all that's gotten here. But from the loose translation I saw, I think the main reason Yuta was still sent is because the curses actually weren't even meant to target him. They were meant to target all of Japan. Like, they, they are just meant to explode. So the millions upon millions, some grade 4, some grade 3s, some grade 2s, some grade 1s, some special grades, they were all going to sl spread out and do everything. And sure, can you definitely argue that Maki may, just due to being that fast, would she most likely be able to just slash all of them with Soul Spook Katana, exercise them, and leave? Of course. But I still think it'd be more difficult. With Rika, as we see here, not only is Yuda able to directly counteract by slicing through them himself but he's also i i wish he kind of it'd be so cool if he just like burst with rct here you just cool factor something we're gonna talk about in a bit later on which is he's still cool don't get me wrong i, I still love you but we're gonna talk about school factor in a little bit but it would have been so cool to just see him like almost <laughs> this sounds so stupid you know piccolo's move i forget what it's called it's like it's like the opposite of evil containment wave like demonic explosive wave where he kind of just like, he grabs his shoulders, and then he... Like, I was low-key hoping he would just do that instead of just slicing through them. But still, this is a cool visual seeing you to tear through curses on curses on curses on curses. But the main thing here is that Rika alone, which is another... I mean, it's not necessarily too crazy. She's obviously, like, the strongest... Yuta isn't a... Sukuna isn't a curse. He's a king of curses, but he's not a curse. He's a sorcerer slash cursed object. So I think it's pretty easy to say that Rika's the strongest curse in the series. Arguably the strongest Shikigami. Like, I say arguably only because Maharaga's cracked. Like, Maharaga versus Rika is a discussion I go back and forth on with my friends all the time, and I'm going to make a video on soon enough. <laughs> Both on in terms of who's the better Shikigami and who would win in a fight. But Rika, we see her just casually tear through it, and at least in the loose translation I saw, it's implied that she took care of everything. Like, these millions of curses that were going to rampage on Japan and slaughter who knows how many innocents. Well, I'd have said it on innocents. That we're going to slaughter who knows how many innocents. Rika, unmanifested. I'm not sure. Let me see. Does Yuta give her a command here? Once again, I don't have full translations or anything. But let me see. Does Yuta give a command? No. Rika just, on orders, 
or maybe subconscious orders, maybe on her own, maybe running solo, she just goes through and starts wiping them, which is super metal. Like, don't get me wrong. We don't get much of it, but once again, chapter is very, very streamlined. We have a lot to get through in this chapter. But it's just the implication that she just alone, like, you, I think this is literally meant to be her. It just, like, almost JoJo's Bizarre Adventuring. Like, straight tearing through curses. Of course, is it a little bit contrived that all these curses, some of which have the ability to fly, the ability to crawl, the ability to go around, is it kind of stupid that they all kind of, you know, like, just charge in a straight line towards the Queen of Curses and that the fact that they're only running in one direction? Yeah. It's it's for the visuals, though. Like, <laughs> like in certain ways, where I'm willing to sacrifice logic and common sense for the cool visual, I'm sacking logic and common sense for the cool visual it is it is infinitely more well i guess you could make it even cooler if like rico was like forced to teleport around and like just like just keep one tapping them keep grabbing them keep erasing them exercising them instantly over and over and over but once again streamlining the chapter you need to streamline it because of how much happens in this chapter we do see kenny's head does get removed from the scenario here in this massive curse conglomerate so this is fine by me. Notably, I, I've seen some mixed reactions. Once again, I've not gone too far into the discussion for this chapter. I'm probably gonna, depending on the timeline later today, I'll probably play. I'll either I'll play Hollow Knight or I'll just stream and talk about the chapter in general later today, or time of today recording. So I'll see. But I've seen some people be really, really annoyed with the fact that Kenny's able to just, like, have these full-on conversations and stuff like that, and do all this while just ahead. But, like, are y'all shocked? I told, I warned y'all. I warned, I warned y'all it looks suspicious. <laughs> like, like, and to be fair, once again, and the same reason why I'm disappointed in Yuta for not going for it, Kenny is the head. Is it kind of fun? I'm not sure. Where are vocal cords? I generally don't, because it looks like he's talking strictly out of Ghetto's mouth. Like, notably, I could excuse this if it was just the brain yapping. But let me see. Vocal cord. <laughs> I, just, I know I know the Googler is always like, why is this man searching up these oddly specific things at these weirdly specific times? Vocal cords. I believe they're in the chest? I don't know. Are they just straight in the throat? Wow. So you mean to tell me? Ooh, ooh, ooh. These look nasty. Hey, woo. Well, let me not. Uh, sh wow. So it is sad. Yuta could have literally still dodged the entire situation if he had just aimed a little bit higher. He could have still gone for the neck, and but then again, the, he has to go for the... The brain has a mouth. The brain has a mouth. So, realistically, he would have had to have gone for the head. Just, once again, it's so... The reason it bothers me so much is because Kenjaku literally has, like... He has, like, markings to show where he, like, sliced and put the brain... Like, Yuta... If you're fast enough to full 360 degree blitz this man, 180 degree reversal Kingdom Hearts 2 slide behind Broski, you're telling me you couldn't aim for the stitches on his dome But regardless of that, seeing Kenny go into yapper mode and expander mode is very, very hilarious to me. And I do like, and if admittedly, putting aside all my biases for how. I'm, I do I. I feel bad calling it plot and do stupidity. But it kind of is. What do you guys think? This is this is the genuine question for y'all. Because, of course, I've been yapping and complaining. But do you guys think this is some plot due stupidity? The fact that Yuta just didn't go for that. Despite all the information he had. Or is this just going to be another, well, he didn't know. Even though he clearly had it. Well, maybe he didn't clearly have to know. If, if someone can rationalize to me how Yuta didn't know to not aim for the head. And how Yuta didn't know to immediately crush it. Please do. So, when I go into the review, <laughs> I'm not, not nettled. <laughs> and to be fair, it's like, the thing is, it's the two, it's the, there are two wolves inside all of us. Which one will, and they're fighting. Which one will win? The one you feed. So please, help me feed the good wolf inside me that's like, this is still good. Because wolf one number one is the Yuda fan being like, Yuda's not this stupid, he would not have fumbled. But the other half of it is like, but more Kenny though. And I love Kenny. <laughs> So I love that he gets to yap off. I love that he gets to summon his Kogane. I love that he has this like creepy, gigantic fusion. And once again, Gege with all the baby imagery, the like, 
container, essentially, for Tengen, which is formed amongst this massive, mass of curses. And, once again, I still love the detail of his Kogane being old with the stitches in of itself. And we see that Yuta begins to have a whole conversation, or, like, he lets Kenny yap here. Why? It, it's kind of, like... Especially considering what he does here, why, why, why let him speak? Like, sure, he's high in the air, but Yuta, you can jump. Like, <laughs> like attack him, Yuta. Or once again, I know the curses are gonna run throughout Japan and cause havoc, but I think you can take the two seconds to have Rika teleport to him and just crush his head like a grape. Like this, this whole interaction is only fostered by Yuta just not making the smart decision. Like. In a similar vein to how I'm going to tackle another thing in this chapter, where I think you can do the same thing, you can accomplish the same metric, but you can make it not as... Well, to be fair, the later issue I have is something that's just a issue with me, and it's just, like, me asking for more than what I should expect from JJK, in a way. But, for this in particular, like, Kenny ain't just talking. Bro's making whole hand gestures and stuff. Like, you, you can just attack, bro. And don't get me wrong, the Tengen baby pops out very, very quickly, which is, ugh, I can't believe Tengen was reduced to that. <laughs> is that an eye on its tail? Like, it, it's, it's looking absolutely nasty. But, that aside, Yuta watching and screaming and in shock as he sees that, like, dude, just attack. Attack. Like, ironically enough, but no, he, the thing is, he does leap up and poke his head later. So, like... The the monkey agenda, the mon the monkey meat muncher meal is about to appear. She could literally just air step to him. And once again, I was <laughs> low key hoping because another thing, another reason. Like don't get me wrong, I've seen a whole bunch of people, especially with you to fighting what you does in this chapter. A whole bunch of people are putting monkey on fraud watch. And like, y'all, relax, relax. I I to be fair, if you're looking for me to justify why monkey hasn't shown up, I can't. I literally, like, there, there have at least been three separate occasions where her appearance would be useful. Straight up. Word for word, Barbara. Like, she, if she had appeared in certain moments, she could have ended the series. And if not ended, drastically slowed it down. Like, Higurumu's domain. Could have walked right in there, decapitated Tsukuna. Or at least taken an arm off. Debuff him somehow. You see how much he's struggling to heal that one hand that he chopped off himself before the execution's blade actually poked it? Imagine if that was his whole arm, or his head, or anything, with Maki and Sosuke Katana. Imagine if she, I don't know, hypothetically, showed up while Higurumo was fighting Tsukuna. While Tsukuna was so focused on the giant talent that rivaled even Satoru Go- She took his head off. Once again, Maki has shown the ability to sneak up on Tsukuna pre-time skip. I don't talk of a super fatigued, brain-damaged Tsukuna, who obviously is worse for wear. And finally, here, she would have just been useful as backup. Sure, you can argue she wouldn't have been as effective against the curses, even though we literally see her wipe out a whole room of grade 2 and lower curses. But, like, once again, that's that's the... whatever. That's the mocking meat muncher in me. Personally, I think she could have just blitzed right through him, but that's, you know, the meat muncher in me. With that being the case, she could have just air-stepped up and removed Bro's Dome, and the plot cannot happen. Or at least the plot that happens at the end of 248 with the rule being transferred or Tengen being transferred to Sukuna can't happen. That would make too much sense, wouldn't it? And I'm start I hate to say I'm starting to see the vision of her just being added to the Hakari fight. And I don't know like Don't get me wrong, if we're going by like scale and narrative weight, it makes sense, right? Like clearly Yuta's more important than Maki. Clearly, Itadori is more important than Maki. And if we aren't going to give Kenny, like, a fight, 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 we're going to give him this little pseudo-fight here. Clearly, we're going to not have Maki here. That wouldn't make sense. And also, we can't have Maki versus Sukuna, or have her do anything against Sukuna, because that's not her fight. Not that they're on a character level, such as the dynamics she would have with Sukuna. Not on a really thematic level, honestly. Like, Yuta, admittedly, is a much better parallel for Sukuna in the whole, like, love versus not love, selfishness versus selflessness. Like, Yuta fits better with Sukuna on a narrative weight level and a character dynamic level. And obviously, Yuji's the main character and has the most beef with Sukuna. So, all that makes sense... But it's not making dollars, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I really wish Maki got to do something sooner. So I understand 
when people are a little bit harsh on my daughter, but you lay off, all right? She's she's doing her best with whatever she's doing. And the thing, you know, the sad thing, I don't want her to interfere with the Hikari fight. I really don't. I want that to be just Hikari versus Arume. Because one, Hikari needs a win that's not circumstantial. Like, he just need. well, to be fair, he has the win, win quote-unquote, over Yuji, but that's an inconclusive fight. Charles is a random. And Kashimo, he because of circumstance. And also, Kashimo wasn't using his curse technique. So I, I do want Hikari to just get a win on his own so I can stop clowning on, bro. But, I don't, I don't know. I only see the vision of her going there now. Unless something pops off of the merger, but how useful is Maki going to be against the merger? Unless, like, the Soulsbook Katana has special properties and she can, like, target Tengen's soul and, like, cut it out the merger and then drag it forth and, like, have Yuji with his soul interaction just drag it out. I, I have no idea how Maki's going to be incorporated outside of the Arume fight, and I really don't like that. I really wish she could have more. But, of course, Yuji stands by, watches Kenny have a whole... <laughs> he uses domain expansion. He uses my domain expansion, in fact. Horizon of the Captivating Yapper. And transfers Tengen over. <laughs> in this very, very freaky imagery of Kenny Burton. And we see... It's... I don't know why. The visual, to me, is so funny. Of just... Tengen the super baby fly off like and it's so weird too because in the last chapter Tengen just appeared like it was like a, a teleport transfer but no I guess Tengen just flew there <laughs> and then we just didn't notice like bro like literally she did the dash and made it go fast forget about the fame all she wanted is them bands like that's crazy to me and of course you know as a natural byproduct Kenny's done his role He's ended his narrative purpose. He created the merger. And I believe in the rough translations, kind of in a similar vein to what happened at the end of 243, he mentions about bowing out, not being able to see what he wanted to see, all that. He does this final conversation with Yuda as Yuda finally went for the head. Boop. But this is the Kenny Copey with me. I'm Elio and the Oh, Lord. Here comes Pencil with all this glaze and all this, this, all this, that. And you're absolutely right. I won't lie to you. I do appreciate that you guys think I'm unbiased and that I don't have agendas. I push agendas. I am an agenda pusher premium. I have agenda push prime. Gosh darn it. So I'll push my darn agendas till I can't push them no more. I need to see definitive proof that this went all the way through. Because notice that Yuda pokes Kenjaku in a very particular spot. Notice this. He doesn't, once again, Yuta does not remove Kenjaku. He doesn't split the brain in half. He specifically pokes Kenjaku right here. Now, if you don't remember, because it's been a long while since we've actually seen, actually not really, it's the talk of a fight, but it's been a hot minute since we've seen Kenny's brain in a full diagram. But look up Kenny's brain real quick. Look at the positioning of where Yuta stabbed him. Notice the fact that Takaba's body is highlighted right down here, smiling and seemingly enough confirmed to be cooked. Like, I kind of, I for the longest time was against the idea of Takaba being cooked, but the fact that Yuta doesn't even bring him back to the battlefield, the fact that no one in this instance teleports and gets his body out of here, nothing happens. I'm smelling a body swap here because unless I'm mistaken, in fact, I'm going to look up a picture of Kenny right now with y'all to make sure I... Because, you know, I've been liable to tweak before, will tweak again, and shall continue tweaking and coping. But let me see. Kenjaku. I'm going to look at manga, because manga is the easiest one here. Let me see. Big Jaku. Pop that domer off. Pop that top off. Yeah. It's a little... Actually, ironically enough, his forehead looks way smaller than it does in this image. But... I think, unless I'm mistaken, the brain is higher, though. The brain is much higher. So maybe he got lower. But remember, Kenny's a masterful user of RCT. And it's entirely possible that since you just stabbed him here, Kenny could have caught the blade between his teeth. I know, that's, I know it sounds so stupid. And I know you're like, pencil. Sometimes I respect the copium, but right now you are currently lost 15 different layers into the sauce. And to that I say you're absolutely right. 
you're spitting. You're, you're going word for word, bar for bar, band for band with me right now, and you're winning. If we're having a band off, you've thrown 50,000 racks, and I've thrown two pennies. But if I'm gay gay, if I'm gay gay, I'm being particular. It's, it's once again, it's kind of like the semantics thing. Whoa, yeah, you would have won the fight. Look, you removed Kenny's head. Oh, yeah, but he removed Kenny's head. But he didn't slice the dome. He didn't slice the dome, though. He didn't slice the dome, though, so Kenny's still alive. Kenny can still speak. He cut low enough on the body that Kenny's vocal cords in Ghetto's body still work. He can still command the original body and have that burst with curse energy and burst with the curses. If I'm gay again, I'm using semantics. And if I'm gay again, I'm using semantics again, and I want Kenny still involved in the narrative one way or another, even if I'm taking the merger away from him. I'm doing something like this. I'm having Yuta, for some reason, once again, not... Not just, not just slice, slice the literal lines that got, like, he literally has a perforated line to slice. I don't know what's going through the Blessed Child's head right now. But, instead of poking right here, it could have been an easy slice right across. If I'm gay gay, I'll cut away. I'll cut away, because he cuts away from this. We do not see Kenny, in fact, Kenny's yapping isn't even cut off here. That's how crazy, that Kenny's yapping does not even stop here. It keeps going. <laughs> like, he's not even perturbed by the fact that he has a literal blade in his head. He's still talking through Ghetto's mouth. So I could literally see that he just caught it in between the brain teeth. Or he opened up the mouth. like Because that is, that is a mouth. There is a mouth on Kenny's brain. If you don't believe me, once again, just look it up. I would, I would show you my Googler variation of it, but the Googler is currently being used as a battery. So, it don't... I'm just saying, I may be huffing copium, but in the same way where I kept telling y'all, don't be shocked if you'd have fumbled and Kenny survived because he didn't go for the dome piece even though he won. Don't be shocked if Kenny shows up again. Most likely not in Ghetto's body. I think Ghetto's body is done. 100 million, billion, trillion percent. But I still don't think Kenny's done. This is, this is, it's too easy a layup. Especially considering what Yuda is immediately forced to do after this point. He needs to leave. He needs to go take care of Sukuna right now. Bodies are hitting the floor. I'm seeing the vision, y'all. Takaba's body's right there for the taking. It's not teleported away at this point. Yuta is forced to leave after he specifically poked Kenny in a spot where it's very likely with the shrunken forehead. Because, you know what? Let me try with the Googler. Nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm afraid of dropping the Googler. But with the location that Yuta stabs and the fact that we don't see him just we don't we don't see the brain get destroyed remember Kenny is the brain do not let the face fool you like it fooled Yuta Kenjaku is the brain and Yuta stabbed him very particularly in a spot where the brain has teeth and presumably a mouth which it could catch the blade in between and Yuta's forced to leave and Takaba's body is still there don't be shocked of course I could be huffing straight copium, and this is just the end for these two characters. Obviously, having Kenny in the narrative any further, if Gage is trying to end this year, extends it a whole lot. Having Takuma in the narrative any further, after he served his purpose of getting rid of Kenny, causes issues. Fusing the two together causes even more issues. But, I'm just saying, don't be surprised. Like I was right about this, don't be shocked if Kenny shows up again. Because I'm still in the can. That Kenny has much, 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 much more potential to offer the narrative. I still think he's a more interesting final villain than Tsukuna. On darn near every... The only level where I will fully concede that Tsukuna's superior is the existing dynamic with Yuji. Because those two spent so much time together and what Yuji's, as a byproduct, making Tsukuna evolve into. That's the one thing I will I'll freely hand you. No doubt about that. For a final antagonist. But, in my eyes... The merger is still the final antagonist. Or at least the final roadblock to overcome. If it pops off, though. Maybe this is maybe the merger just isn't meant to pop off. Because, of course, <laughs> like, I always talk about the merger as if it's a guarantee. But if the merger happens, all of Japan's cooked. What, are we going to, like, are we going to, like, use the Dragon Balls and restore all the people of Japan from the merger? Like, obviously, the merger would have massive consequences on the rest of the series that would not go unnoticed. But who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But, essentially... Oh, my last bit of cope. You uh, pokes Kenny through the head, where his mouth teeth are, based on the shifting of the forehead scale, and Takwa's body still lying around. Uyui and Kiara aren't shown to come and pick it up. I don't think they know. I, I, I highly doubt they thought Takwa was cooked. 
Heck, I, for the longest time, didn't think Taco Bell was cooked. So they likely didn't show up and come get him. Kenny could still very easily hop body, since we still don't know how the technique works. We just don't. And Yuta was forced to leave after this. Presumably, Rika just slaughtered the rest of the cursed spirits, which is still crazy metal, by the way. Like, the fact that she just went out and slaughtered all the cursed spirits while unmanifested. Buku bakers. But, Yuta pokes the head. He does not destroy it. And he has to leave. So, do not be surprised. But, of course, next up. I told you we were going to be here for a minute. I'm realizing I'm, like, five pages in the chapter. But we open up. And we cut back to the demon infested Shinjuku. The uninhabited demon infested Shinjuku. And we get this three-way stare down. <laughs> I, I love all the faces of the different characters here. Yuta just looks... <laughs> and I think he's, like... I think he's mad over the fact that he fumbled. And, like... I'd be mad, too. Understandable. Quite understandable, good sir. Have a nice day. I love how Sukuna, like, it's hard to tell with this image, but it looks like he's, like, half locked in, half smiling, but I'm not sure. And Rika's just... Like, <laughs> like I don't know. Rika's here for the vibes. But, admittedly, as cool as it is for you to try and go ban for ban in base, why does he go ban for ban in base? Well, we'll see. As this is unmanifested Rika still. And sure, don't get me wrong, Manifest Rika is massive and is currently holding down Sukuna. But as we see, yeah. Your boy was a little bit on the money. What can I say? Way, way back. I made the first Yuta vs. Sukuna video. Then I made another Yuta vs. Sukuna video after he got his plot not plot amps. When he got his power-ups, because I can't call them plot amps. Like it literally makes sense. Like if everyone else is gonna get much drastically stronger in a month, Yuta can get drastically stronger in a month. So, like, that's not plot. That's just literally you to having insane potential and having some of the best teachers and training partners out there. But, I knew he wasn't him. <laughs> or at least, I knew Rika wasn't her, and by proxy, Yuta wasn't him. At least in base. Though, something is pointed out here. Once again, this is the beauty of translations. I can only garner so much from the images, and the rough translations I have are not complete on what Yuta's saying here. But even Yuta's noticing something's up with Sukuna's hand. And the RCT with it. And the fact that it's still steaming. Something's wrong with that. So, this is no incidental detail. Something did happen to Sukuna's hand. A lot of people, and I'm leaning towards the idea, are theorizing that even though Sukuna removed the hand before Higuruma stabbed it, by Higuruma stabbing that hand, he killed the concept of that hand. Like, that part of Sukuna's soul is gone. Even though it was disconnected from his body. So, as he's trying to regenerate it, he's kind of just like ghosting the form of it and is constantly fueling rct into it in order to keep it there but as long as it's still there as unless he the moment he stops pumping rct is going to disintegrate it's going to perish because that part of his soul is dead which is a very interesting concept but i'm not exactly sure once again i'll have to wait for the translation on that one however of course we do get to see that naturally you sees the weakness and is like you know i gotta get that for real for real rika -chan sack yourself and we see that rika -chan does in fact sack herself as he utters a command and so <laughs> so gonna do this bro he's always cheesing he's like cheesing deviously at every single opportunity bro's like go ahead queen and her little pawn come and try and take down the big juicy king and we see you the lunges forward and he goes to Blitzukuna, of course, and he uses Rika as cover very particularly. But notably, it just doesn't work. Because, like, once again, what Yuda had, very particularly, though I will admit it's very, very impressive that Yuda forces Sukuna to dodge. Meaning that, well, I mean, I guess it's kind of, like, he was dodging. Actually, no, no, I don't think so. He wasn't dodging. The, uh, this is just a testament to Yuda. Yuda's going to get more feats later on in this chapter. Feats in question mark, but I think these they're they are canon. <laughs> like I, I cannot debate these, but I think Yuta is trying to solidify himself as number three in the verse. Because remember, the only time that Sukuna has dodged or blocked or done anything relative to his opponents, the moment since he's incarnated is against Kashimo's electromagnetic waves. He palmed, blocked, cold heart stopped everything. Of course, he cold heart stops Yuta's blade here. He grabs a katana by like with his bare hands though i think it's mentioned i saw in the rough translations that like apparently he's using like miniature dismantles in his palm or like miniature cleaves to keep himself from being cut by the blade meaning that hand body sukuna would be damaged by yuda's attacks if he needs to grip it with cleaves and dismantles 
So that's very, very good. And also, the sword's able to live through that? Very, very impressive. But what's that sword made out of? Like, Yuji was kicking these things apart. You to where? Who's your swordsmith? Let me know, please. But of course, you to realize is that, well, sure. He may be using cleaves and dismantles to try and hold off the blade. He wasn't able to be pressed by the blade. And notably, like, you... <laughs> Once again, I don't know about y'all. You do it as a massive family. The, the, that guy with the family is the other name of that guy with the pencil. And it is always so hilarious whenever any of my younger cousins go to fight me. And they, like, pick up the biggest stick they can muster. And they're like, I will get you, pencil man! And I'm like, okay. And then they go to stab you, and then it's just like, you grab the stick. Typically, I don't yank it out of their hands because I'm worried about hurting them. I just break the stick. <laughs> so, like, it is a tad disrespectful, even more disrespectful, that Sukuna just rips the blade out of his hands. But then again, maybe Yuta just lets go here? I'm not exactly sure. Once again, I'm interested to see what translations say for this. But we see Sukuna does immediately notice Rika charging in for the easy lick, supposedly. And she just... I am, I, I see, the thing is, this chapter has so many highs to it for me. Like, I know y'all are going to be so shocked by the designation I give this chapter, especially with how much more complaining I still have to be doing in the spoiler discussion. I, I have no idea. Maybe the review's going to be way shorter because I'm going to do a whole bunch of yapping here. But knowing me, it won't be. Dialogue only makes me yap more. But I am very disappointed in Rika here, especially because, like, is it me or did she shrink? Like, she went from massive in last chapter to the point where her whole palm could rest and cover Sukuna's entire body. But now she's so tiny that her hand's barely bigger than Sukuna's torso? Like, like I, I don't know. It's a little, a little embarrassing. Just a teeny tiny bit. Like, yep. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I really, I was expecting, like, don't get me wrong. I even brought some of my recent Yuta V Sukuna video, and even in my buffing the Queen of Curses, because I believe she needed it. I did mention the Gege statement. Gege, long time ago. I forget when the exact statement's from. I'm not sure if it's from an interview or a Q&A question or something like that. But someone did ask, oh, <laughs> who's stronger, her or him? Well, if Sukuna regained all his power, Rika wouldn't cause him any trouble, because he literally just said Sukuna. Like, Sukuna, one word answer. He very clearly said that Sukuna was the superior curse or leader or res respective representative of curses, right? Like, queen of curses versus king of curses, the king is superior. That's basically what he said here. So, is it shocking to me that unmanifested Rika kind of just gets one-tapped here? Or not one-tapped, but at least knocked away with one arm? Not necessarily, but I am a little bit disappointed. Especially considering she was so much more massive last chapter. I was talking all that smack, only to literally get smacked. Like, it, it does, it does not tickle my fancy, to say the very least. It does not, it is, it ruffles my jimmies. Just a teeny bit, tiny bit. It ruffles my jimmies. But, jimmies being rustled aside, man, Sugano looks ugly here, bro. I, I know it's, it's hard to draw four on people. You're looking at a massive Ben 10 fan. A Ben 10 fan who for a long time in his life, his favorite alien, well, not favorite alien, but one of my top five favorite aliens was Forearms. If I were to whip out some of the old sketchbooks, the amount of times I've drawn Forearms is embarrassing. He was really hard for me. I don't know, anything remotely humanoid, and I mean remotely because Forearms is barely humanoid, anything remotely humanoid was hard for me to do. Characters like Heat Blast, no problem. Accelerate, well, I say no problem, they also look awful bad. But still, it was so much easier for me to draw them. But still, don't get me wrong, it is hard to make forearm people look good. Because when it's just not natural, you can't, you cannot anatomy through that. But like, this image is just so ugly for a couple different reasons. Once again, I may chalk it up to the quality, I will see it. However, one thing that is amazing for you to hear, one, it looks like he tanks some dismantles to the face, for one, and two, he also manages to admittedly I think this is supposed to be... Ju he knocks some juice out of Sukuna with a regular hit. Y'all. It's... I, like, I'm gonna make the video, specifically because a $25 patron asked for the video, Calvin Elder. You'll be in that video sooner than you think. I'm sorry, I, I didn't... I wanted to wait a little bit longer before I made the video, because the very old question, who's the true number three in the verse, Kashimo, Yuda, or Kenjaku, Big Jaku, but... 
based on this right here, if he really made you Sukuna just spit up a little bit of juice, it's gonna be that time. Like, it, it may just flat out be that time. In fact, you can become a member for as low as $1 a month, or as a, no, a member for as low as $3 a month, or become a patron for as low as $1 a month. And we get things like early content after videos and live reactions just live reaction this very chapter when it finally gets translated but also if you become a 25 dollar member you can just order a video like like literally like you you kind of just have free reign to order me to make a video essentially just think of like paying 25 dollars for a video for me it can literally be anything it can be on a series i haven't read you can like command me to at least like read it like i can't read an entire series like if someone were to become a 25 dollar patron be like read fairy tale and give a full review on it i'll do my best but, like, there are some limitations, but, like, just order a video if you really want one. But 45 minutes in, I wonder if anyone's even going to hear that. But, with it being the case, Yuta drawing juice from hand body Sukuna with just a regular punch, no black flash, no nothing. Kashima wasn't doing all that, yo. I gotta knock him down. But once again, we'll get more content. But then again, it's not even needed. Because if he's doing this with regular punches, Kashimo couldn't even land a hit. Uh, but to be fair, you know, Sugino's handling a 2v1, but he literally has four arms. So, if he could have dodged it, he would have dodged it. And if he wouldn't have taken damage, he wouldn't have taken damage. But, we see. However, we see that Yuta does get his hand on the blade. He swings, but it goes to show that Sugino still does have some sort of superiority. He does manage to steal his blade back. But Yuta, Sugino does just immediately dodge. And Rika does go in to slam Sugino with what Looks like a vending machine. And we see Sukuna just like... <laughs> he literally cleaves the vending machine apart with one tap as he goes for Yuta with another. But Yuta does weave. Once again, Yuta is showing some real good stuff here. Admittedly, a lot of people were asking this, and I'm kind of leaning for it too, but I understand. it's It goes back to the Gojo situation. It seems like other people would just get in the way. A lot of people are wondering why you just 1v1-ing Sukuna right now. Admittedly, it's not 1v1-ing. It's the natural case of Yuta Akotsu doing his solo Jujutsu jumping with Rika. But I do think, like, unless it's Maki, unless it's Hikari, or unless it's Yuji, they would have all gotten in the way. Right? Like, if Rika whiffs, Rika whiffs and one taps one of their allies. So if we're getting Sukuna versus Yuta, we're just going to get Sukuna versus Yuta. And I'm still happy to get it, right? This is some really good choreography. I love the paneling here. I love that he slashes through the vending machine. You see the vending machine pieces fall apart. Rika swaps places. Teleports pops out here. Yuta dodges and swings around, avoiding Sukuna's hands. You see him swing for another one. Sukuna still casually blocks it off, though. Just poof, smacks it away as he blocks another one of Rika's punches. He does get... I'm not sure if he gets knocked back, though. I need, once again, this is just a thing of the art, though I do think these are motion lines, so I think Sukuna does get knocked back a bit, but he still manages to block the punches, and you see Yuta has taken some more damage, but still, he's eating cleaves, or presumably dismantles, whichever one, with very little problem, and he's not healing them, at least not right now. And you can see Sukuna, he's still just like, oh, you kids, you're so adorable. <laughs> so, it is. it goes to show Yuta's powerful, but he's still not Satoru Gojo. Which is fine by me. I'm fully, I'm fully fine with the idea that Yuta is able to press Sukuna a bit, especially with the help of Rika. But I'm also fine with the idea that Yuta is not Satoru Gojo level yet. If this, maybe if it were Gojo and Rika, or maybe if it was Gojo, Rika, and Yuta, they could go crazy. But right now, Sukuna, he's still very, very comfortable with the battle at hand. He just needed to do a little bit of adjusting, and now that he's adjusted, he's all good. But if you were wondering why Yuta was fighting in base. You just slid on a little something, something. Though, admittedly, Yuta, that's that's not your ring thing. Like, am I, am I tweaking? Does he have like six fingers in the shot? What is? Either either bro has six fingers in this shot, or he put it on his middle finger. Regardless, I, that's not the that's not the that's not the ring that's not the ring finger. Like, ring finger, ring finger, and like, hold on. Let me double check. Yuta Akotsu. Mengi. Let me see. Give me everything. I'm going to chalk this up to an art error. Yeah. Yuta knows his fingers. <laughs> so maybe I'm going to chalk it up to an art error. 
It seems consistent, though, because, like, it's on his middle finger twice. So, so like, maybe Gay just forgot what the ring finger was, or maybe it's just Yuta being desperate in this moment and going for it. But regardless, he does put the ring on the wrong finger. <laughs> and depending on how you interpret this, he may have six fingers in the shot, because you have the thumb, then one, two, three, four, and then this is the katana hilt, but then there's also this extra fold that could be another finger. But that also could just be, like... The fold that represents this part of the hand. I'm going to go with that so he doesn't have six fingers. He just put the ring on his middle finger for some reason. However, we do get to see that Yudo Kotsu finally gives it to us. He finally says, forget about it. I ain't getting slashed no more. We shall dream no more as we delve into his domain expansion. Even you, even Sukuna's is like, oh, shoot, I forgot the kid could do this. Or no, I think he just didn't know. I Because notably, Yuda never showed it. He never showed it or even mentioned it while he was in Yuji's body. So Sugana looks genuinely caught off guard here for good reason. And this is crazy. He doesn't dodge. He is trapped within Yuda Kosu's domain expansion. So, I'll admit. I feel like, that's the I feel like I'm being so negative towards Yuda. And I feel bad for that, but... They had your folks. But there's one thing I always want to be with y'all. It's honest on my thoughts. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I like the domain, but at the same time, I don't wanna say it's lazy. Because that's wrong of me. And like, sure, I I made a video talking about you to domain expense, but I didn't draw up a concept form or anything like that. And even then I like the somewhat I somewhat like the application of this. But Yuta's domain expansion being, admittedly, a very cool graveyard of swords with the... I forget what these are called, but I know these things have to do with, like, love and or fate, and I believe the domain itself is named something like Love, Enchanting, Binding, Wow, or whatever. Like, it is very specifically a love domain type, and that's fine by me. I do like that Yuta gets something of that sort. And even, even the blandness of the domain fits into it, as we'll get into, but it is a little bit underwhelmed. I'm not sure what I expected, though. Like, notably, it is very similar to one of the ideas I had. Uh, one of the ideas that I thought would come with Yuta's domain is that he just gets unlimited access to his curse techniques. Like, like straight up unlimited access. As long as his domain is open, he can access all the curse techniques he wants freely, maybe stack them, all stuff like that. That was my most basic interpretation of the domain. And, of course, I guess it's hard to make that look more interesting, especially considering that probably wouldn't come with a sure hit. Just like this may not have a sure hit, but I think it does based on what Sukuna is forced to do this entire chapter. So it does have a sure hit. I do kind of wish the domain looked a little bit cooler. And here's the thing, right? It's revealed that this domain, one, has a sure hit. Because Sukuna is immediately forced to resort to Hollow Wicker Basket. Interesting how he goes towards Hollow Wicker Basket and not Symbol Domain. Which is just something that he did see. And he did see Gojo Santoru fight while using Symbol Domain. That's interesting. He goes for Hollow Wicker Basket, and very particularly, he goes for Hollow Wicker Basket with two hands. Like, well, not two hands, both sets of hands. When we've seen Hollow Wicker Basket be performed with just the one hand. So I wonder why he's going for two? Like, isn't the whole point of him being built perfectly for sorcery is that he could, like, do one thing and the other at the same time? Like, so why do you need, why do you need both hands, bucko? Like, like you, can, you can cast Hollow Wicker Basket with one. I don't know. Weird, though I do like this portrayal of Hollow Wicker Basket. I do love Sukuna posted up inside the Hollow Wicker Basket. But we see Yuta Kotsu. Bro wastes no time. He grabs a blade from the floor of his domain and he slams Sukuna dead on. Sukuna does block with one arm, but notice how the blade bursts. And we see, I believe this is Thin Icebreaker. This was the one technique that I was confident was going to be useful against Sukuna, and it very clearly is. It causes this massive explosion that tears through everything, and we see the blade itself immediately disintegrate. And Sukuna has taken solid damage from it. Like, a whole chunk of his face and eye are missing here. And note, remember, he blocked. He blocked, and he still got torn through like this. So yeah. Essentially, Yuta versus Kashimo, even CT. Like, the only thing you'd be able to argue is a speed blitz, but even then, 
That's debatable. Of course, you can definitely still make the argument that Sukuna's holding back here, but that's getting less and less viable. At least against Yuta. It's very hard to argue that now. So, that's that. Now, the main reason I say the domain's a little bit underwhelming, and what I would add to it to make it look a little bit more spicy, as much as I do like the graveyard blade aesthetic, because, like, here's the thing. If I had to take a guess on why Gage designed it like this, one, I believe these ties here have to do with, like, the ties of fate or the ties of love, and I think Yuta and Rika, when Rika was still alive, made one of these ties? But I may be tweaking. I, I generally don't remember. So, like, I think these ties are, like, reminiscent of love or fate or something of the sort, which ties into Yuta. Makes sense, right? The graveyard makes sense as well. Yuta is a person deeply associated with death. Like, a control over the ability to manipulate life and death. That's a, that's a big part of Yuta's kit, personality, all that. This is all well established. Makes sense. Even the sword aesthetic. Admittedly, the sword aesthetic does feel a little bit weird. Like... It'd be like if, I don't know, there's no like equal comparison, but the sword aesthetic is a teeny tiny bit weird. It feels like a Bleach reference, I'm not going to lie. Like, I, I, like I, I immediately saw this and thought of a Bankai, but like the reason I think it's a little bit bland and what I would do to spice it up, but keep the concept basically the same, all of these blades represent cursed techniques, right? Because he picks up the sword and then uses sky manipulation through it. And then, boom, the sky manipulation, then Icebreaker does damage. The one detail I would have done, and you could definitely repeat some. Once again, we don't know the full depth of Yuta's techniques or how deep his bag is. The one thing I would have done to make the domain a little bit more unique and have it be a little bit more cool and maybe telegraph some things a bit more, I'd say give every blade a slightly unique design. It doesn't have to be massive, because here's the thing. There are a lot of swords on this page. Like, in this one page alone, one, two, three, four, five. And those are just in the foreground. I'm not to talk of six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> the six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, forty, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. And this is all in this one page. This is a dual spread. Like heck, in this one image alone on the next page. Not this one. But this one right here after the thin icebreaker, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I get why Yay yeah, didn't do it. It just went with the generic like copy paste sword design. What I would have done. For this blade, for example, say this is the Sky Manipulation Blade, I would make the blade itself, I'd make it transparent, make it clear, like the sky, and then maybe make the hilt a cloud. Say he's going to use Cursed Speech, maybe have one blade, the hilt is akin to like a microphone, or a megaphone, or some, I think microphone works better, because like, that could like hypothetically be used as a sword hilt, and then you could have the blade covered in the markings of the Inumaki clan, of the Toge clan. No, it is the Inumaki clan. And the blade is covered in those markings, and then he uses cursed speech through it. For true Shikigami technique, the blade could be like a creature, and who knows what else he has. I presume the sure hit, a lot of people are theorizing this, and I'm going to theorize it too. We'll see when translations drop. But I'm assuming the sure hit is something akin to Angel's technique. You know, Jacob's Ladder. I think that's what it is, and it's why Sukun is forced to hold symbol domain, because he still, like, legally counts as an evil spirit. An eagle spirit? Oh, no, not an eagle spirit, but, like, an evil spirit in a way, even though he's not actually a curse. And thusly, that's why he needs to hold symbol domain, even though the sure hit seems to not be affecting anybody else, not even another certain invader who's in this realm. But... I'd say still do that. Just vary them. You don't have to. You don't have to make every single blade unique. I, I don't think there are this many curse techniques in the series. Like every every single one of these swords. I don't. I don't think there's that many curse techniques in the series. There's eight. Like if you were to count all the blades on here and then quantify every single curse technique, even if you were to have handed you to the wiki, yeah, you know, I, I don't think he'd be able to manifest this many different curse techniques. So you can have them overlap. But just to add a bit more uniqueness to the domain, give them all that unique design. Keep it in that way. And that'd be really, really cool. At least in my opinion. And also, where's Fully Manifested Rika? Like, he slides the ring on, but it seems like Rika was excluded from the domain? Which is weird. Like, don't get me wrong, Rika gets not closer to Yuta, and then Yuta catches Sukuna off guard with the domain expansion. But you're telling me you couldn't include Rika in there? And sure, it's cool that you are able to attack him and that you is able to use sky manipulation and breach Sukuna's defenses like this. That's cool. But you're telling me you're a super strong Shikigami who currently doesn't have anything else to do because you supposedly got rid of the other main antagonist already? Why is it not in there with you, helping you punch? 
I can kind of think of an excuse, though. And I think it is that Ryoman Sukuna is, once again, not actually meant to be slain. Not by Yuda, not by Maki, not by Akari. He still holds Megami Fushiguro. And Yuda Kotsu is working with Yuji Tadori to save him. And we see that Tsukuna realizes that something about Yuji's technique allows him to cup, to grasp, to tear away at the soul. So essentially, Yuji's goal is to beat up the King of Curses and get Megami's body back. Tsukuna is going to be forced to hold Hollow Wicker Basket, so essentially Yuji's getting free licks. And Rika does appear at the end of the chapter. Once again, for a chapter that's supposed to be hyped up as the Queen and her pawns versus the King and his plot armor, I saw that straight from an edit from TikTok. But still... As a chapter that was meant to be hyped up for that, for Rika to land, what, one hit and not even be shown to fully manifest is kind of embarrassing, I'm not going to lie. I really was hoping more from her, but hey, I'm still glad for you to dubs. You to dubs, you to dubs, you to dubs. It's why Shock Horror, in spite of all my complaining and all my yapping, yeah, the chapter's still worthy. I do love this chapter for numerous different reasons. Once again, putting aside my biases and my dis dislike for the plot and too stupidity for you to, in 243, that he would allow something like this to happen when I know he's smarter than this, hey, I got more Kenny. I got more of the Yaposaurus Rex. And I got to see you to flex against all these different curses of all these different levels. And just, even if we don't get to see too much of it, the implication of unmanifested Rika body bagging hundreds if not thousands of grade fours to special grade curses on her own literally tearing them apart limb from limb as they try to escape and wreak havoc across japan more of yaposaurus rex the confirmation that your boy was in fact a little bit wrong and we get to see the rule get added and the transfer and really the rebirth of tengen in order to into something that can be transferred over to sukuna and the nice little final conversation between yuda and kenjaku some last acknowledgement of takaba I'll take it. I still, once again, I, I gave you my copium. Please respond. <laughs> I showed you my copium. Please respond. But, and you can, you can respond negatively too. I don't blame you. But, I gave you my copium about Kenny. And why I still think it's entirely possible. Bro could still be in the kitchen. Risk the whipping. But, that aside, the fact that Bro got pierced through the domer. Big domer. Big Kenjers. <laughs> big, why did, I, why did I say big Kenjers? But, big Kenny. I can still see the chance that he's still around since Yuda made another mistake and didn't slice his dome piece off. But Yuda making the mistake here, it's still fine. He rectifies it by piercing Kenjaku and presumably getting rid of him again. Of course, Takaba's left behind, but yeah, you gotta leave Takaba behind. And once again, Rocket Baby, Tenkin is hilarious to me. And also, hey. The one issue I always had with Yuda is that we were going heavy on narrative. Heavy, 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 heavy on narrative. And overall, his feats just kind of weren't comparing. They just weren't, at least in my opinion. They just weren't on panel comparing. Sure, the Sendai fight, legendary. My One of my favorite fights in the entire series. I can't say my favorite. I have, like, three or two above Sendai. But I really, really like Sendai. But... I don't know. The, the math wasn't math, and I thought Yuta just got bad matchup diff. I thought he didn't have the AP. I thought he didn't have the speed. I, think, I didn't think he had much of anything. Okay, that's a lie. He clearly had a lot, but still, I didn't think he was just that guy. But here we see Yuta Okotsu pressing the King of Curses all by himself. Of course, Sugen is still very, very casual, still smiling throughout the entire chapter, but he was smiling against Gojo. And I know there's a massive group of people that think Gojo doesn't scale to Sukuna at all. Because Gojo said Sukuna held back. Do what you will with that. But then I don't want to I don't want to hear anything about you to scaling to Sukuna then. And he, he, you can't have both. You can't have both. You can't have someone who's explicitly stated stronger than Yuta not scale scale to Sukuna, while the guy who was explicitly stated stronger than Yuta doesn't scale to Sukuna. You can't have both. You can believe one or the other. You can believe that Yuta scales to Sukuna, but go but then again, you can't can you really? Can you believe? You can't believe Gojo. You have to believe Gojo scales with him by proxy Yuta scales to this Sukuna. And once again, I could kind of see the vision of Yuta being above because we actually see him land a hit. Admittedly, it's a 2v1 kind of hit, but still it's a hit. On Sukuna, we see him draw blood from Sukuna with a regular punch. And we see Sukuna being forced to at least acknowledge unmanifested Rika and block and dodge and cleave her attacks apart. And then, of course, we see Yuta. Trap Sukuna in Domain. Of course, 
the, oh, I didn't even mention this. This kind of soft confirms that Sukuna Domain's not a thing. So that's one hot, well, maybe, who knows what we'll open up next chapter with. Because there is a big question, a big cliffhanger that's open by the end of this chapter. How's Sukuna going to get out of this, if at all? Maybe he won't. I think he will, though. The big question that's opened up here for 250 and beyond, how's Sukuna going to get out of this? Because the fact that he goes with Hollow Wicker Basket and not a domain of his own means that the brain damage from Santoru Gojo most likely still lasts. Meaning Gojo did do something, because worse comes worse. If Sukuna didn't have the brain damage, he'd just domain back and presumably crush Yuta's barrier domain. Because it still is very clearly a barrier domain. I saw some people theorizing just based on how the domain is designed that it's an open barrier domain. Yeah, y'all, like we literally, we literally see the black, <laughs> like we see, like we see the darker than dark form, and like the rest of the domain is very, the rest of the chapter is clearly clouded in the darkness of a domain. So like, no, Yuta did not spontaneously develop an open barrier domain, as far as I can tell, at least from the raws. But seeing Yuta tag Sukuna, draw blood from him with regular hits, and also tag Sukuna and Billy Wallow within his domain, and while Sukuna has to hold still, seeing him tag Sukuna and use sky manipulation to this degree to do this level of damage. More than Kashimo did. More than Kenny did. Y'all, it may be time. I, gotta, I may have to... I, I hate to say it. Unless, unless Maki really does come in and get some crazy... And I mean crazy feats. Admittedly, I still think Maki's a bad matchup for a majority, if not all the other heavy hitters. Depending on how her speed stacks up still. And obviously, so is Katana. But... Unless Maki gets something more, these feats are better. These feats are just verbatim better. Plus the narrative, plus everything else. Meaning I would have to give Yuta that fight. He lands hits and does do damage to Sukuna. I have to put to put him above Kashima for that. Same thing with Kenny. Same thing with Yuji. Same thing with Akadi. Yuta, I think now, with this chapter, with this chapter, I'll see. Maybe translations will change my mind. Maybe... The, the Yuta, the my the other Yuta antis out there, maybe they're gonna come and change my mind. But right now, it's looking like Yuta's top three, locked in. So for everyone who wanted it, I'd still be worried for your boy though. I don't think I still don't think he's making it to the end of the series. But with that being the case, it's Yuji's turn up next. He's going to have to clutch up. Why he isn't under the effect of the shirt of the domain? No idea. Maybe it's just Yuta's a precise, amazing domain control. What is Rika going to do, since she's still seemingly unmanifested? I have no idea. But I'm very interested to see what happens next. I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Make it all the way to the end of this hour-plus-long yap session. Golly, I hope this exports sometime. But, with that being the case, if you made it all the way to the end of this video, please leave. The King of Love. <laughs> that sounds so stupid, but we're going to go with it. The King of Love in the comment section down below. I would like to thank you guys so much for watching. Please remember to leave a like, share, comment, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that little notification bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also I do happen to have a Patreon down below where you can support me for as low as $1 a month. Get things like exclusive videos, early content, and more. You can also now become a member to the channel for as low as $3 a month to get the same perks and more. Some of those perks include the live reaction to this very chapter, ad-free variations of all my videos, and more more. Now, I would like to thank you so much for watching once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This happens to be that guy with the pencil, writing off. I'd like to give a thank you to our three dollar members: Connor Plays, Red Wolf Four Seven Six Five, Greyhound, and Akids Void. I'd like to give another thank you to our five dollar patrons: Victor, Sean, RNG Master, Midnight Gem Lord, Metal Solid Crisis, Kevin, Igneal. And Demix LND. I'd like to give another thank you to our $7 member, Autumn's Morning Lazo. I'd like to give another chunk of thank you to our $10 patrons, Robbie Uchiha, Joaquin, iDemokami, and China Doll 09. I'd like to give a fat, juicy, scrumdilly thank you to our wonderful $25 member, Alex Ice Rose. I'd like to give another hefty, hefty, trifty, nifty thank you to our $25 patron, Calvin Elder.